For anyone that doesn't know, the Glorybringer ship is probably the most controversial topic in Wings of Fire. Long ago, I decided I wasn't going to touch it with a 10-foot pole for fear of what the fandom might do if I did. But I thought about it a lot, and I've come to the conclusion that that is the exact reason I have to talk about it. In this video, I'm attempting the impossible. I'm going to try to discuss the Glorybringer ship in such a way that everybody comes away, if not satisfied, then at least with a new way of thinking to consider. My fundamental argument in this video is that the disagreement in the fandom is caused by a disagreement in perspective, and that if we take the time to understand one another's points of view, we can collectively have much more respectful and much more productive conversations about the topic. So, let's get into it. We begin with the two perspectives, the two points of view that operate in opposition to each other. There is the canon perspective, what actually happens in the series, and there is what I'm going to refer to as the intended perspective, what the author meant to happen in the series. 99% of the time, these two perspectives align well, because authors are good at writing what they mean to write, but every now and then they make a mistake, and what they wanted to happen is not what actually happened. And that leaves us with a problem. Which perspective do we take? Do we go with what's actually written, or should we follow instead what the author wanted it to be? Hold that question in mind because we're going to come back to it soon. Before we do though, I want to take some time to lay out each perspective as it applies to the Glorybringer ship and discuss some of the implications that each perspective holds. We'll start with the canon perspective, what actually happens in the books. The year is 5011 AS, and one fateful day on the edge of the Ice Kingdom, Glory and Deathbringer meet for the first time, and soon after fall hopelessly in love. From various descriptions, we know that the Dragonettes of Destiny hatched approximately six years prior to this meeting, and that two years before that, Deathbringer was four. In other words, at their first meeting, Glory is about six, and Deathbringer is about twelve. Now, dragons age differently than humans, lots of people have done these calculations, and the general consensus is that Glory is the human equivalent of sixteen to seventeen, and Deathbringer is in his mid to late twenties. That is canon. And that's a bit of a problem. In the human world, the vast majority of relationships between high schoolers and people a decade older than that are not good or healthy, or safe. Unfortunately, these kinds of relationships do exist. People are groomed, taken advantage of, and hurt because of it. Now, the immediate response to that is, of course, that these are not humans we're talking about. These are dragons, and their society obviously works differently than ours. That is true. That is objectively correct. The dragon world works differently than does our own. However, it also doesn't matter. Because, at the end of the day, we interpret what we read through the lens of our own experiences, our own beliefs, our own cultures, and what we read in turn influences how we interpret those experiences, what we choose to believe, and how our own cultural understandings are shaped. That necessarily happens when we read a story and think about any part of it. We don't have to agree with what is said, but the ideas presented are nonetheless considered. In Wings of Fire, the fact of the matter is that a relationship between two characters for whom the age difference is unacceptably large does not only exist, but is actually brought center stage and glorified. Now, that wasn't meant to be a play on words, but I do think it accurately describes the relationship. At least in the first arc, it's the only one one that both gets more than a chapter or two of representation, and works for both the characters during those chapters. Maybe for these two dragons, in their dragon society, the relationship is fine. From the canon perspective, however, it doesn't matter if it works for these two specific characters, because the broader impact it serves is to normalize that which should not be normalized in the real world. That, at its core, is the issue the canon perspective implies. So, now that we've established that, let's take a look at the other perspective, the intended perspective. To make a long point as succinctly as I can, Deathbringer isn't supposed to be as old as he is. Tui Sutherland, the author, wrote the winglet Assassin, in which we get the clues that allow us to piece together Deathbringer's age, two years after she wrote book three, and a year after she had finished the entirety of the first arc. So, I think it's safe to assume that she hadn't planned the events of 
of Assassin while writing Book 3. Perhaps, most tellingly, in Book 4 he is described as a dragonette, which we know should only apply to dragons under about seven years of age. That part is important, because it implies that, while she was writing all of the scenes in which Glory and Deathbringer interact in Arc 1, she had a very different age for Deathbringer in mind. People dislike the ship primarily because they see it as a representation of, well, grooming, basically. But, at its core, the relationship was not written that way. It was only after the fact that that concern even became a consideration. To understand the intended perspective, then, we have to set aside what we know about the canon for just a moment, and instead analyze how these characters were written before Deathbringer's canon age was introduced, because that is what the relationship is. Deathbringer is a bit of a goofball, but he seems to know a thing or two about how the world works, so it's rather unclear how old he's supposed to be from that information alone. Looking to his physical description, we know he's only a little bigger than Starflight, which is probably important given that dragons continually grow as they age, and that most adults in the series are described as being much larger than the Dragonettes of Destiny, of whom Starflight is probably the smallest. Glory, on the other hand, and especially from the second half of Book 3 onwards, is written as as the most mature dragonette of destiny. In fact, she acts more mature than almost any other dragon in the series. From the moment she challenges the Rainwing Queens for the throne, she is constantly putting others before herself, acting rationally instead of emotionally, leading with a calm confidence, and, well, j just look at any scene she interacts with Kinkajou in. And I mean any scene. She is Kinkajou's adopted mother in every way except title. Glory doesn't act like a normal 17-year-old, and Deathbringer isn't portrayed as a normal adult dragon. Again, as I said earlier, if we set aside what we know is a flawed canon for just a moment, the relationship between these two is just a relationship between two dragons who really look out for one another. I mean, he risks his life to save her in book three, and she in turn risks her life to save him in book four. They genuinely care for one another. And that is the intended perspective. That's how we were always supposed to view things. It wasn't until two years afterwards that anything about that changed, and when it did change, it was an accident. So now we can go back to the original question. Which of these two perspectives are we supposed to take? My suggestion to you is to not force yourself to consider only a single perspective, because no matter which perspective you choose, the other will always exist, and there will always be other people who hold it. In order to truly understand the relationship, you have to consider both. If you don't, it would be like trying to understand how a car works by looking only at the dashboard, or only at the engine, or only the wheels. If you narrow your focus and don't consider the entire car as a complete unit, you'll never understand how it moves, how it's steered, or how it powers itself, at least not all at the same time. The same thing applies here. If you want to understand Glorybringer, you can't just focus on one single way of thinking about it. So what does this mean? If we consider both perspectives at the same time, what should we think about the ship? Well, first, I think we have to stop pretending the ship is entirely fine. It's not. Maybe within the confines of the books it could be, but the reality is that the ship does not exist only within the books. It is also outside, it's in our world, in our minds, and in some of our hearts. That means we have a responsibility to condemn the parts of it that are bad, to do our best to ensure they don't have a negative influence on the lives of real people. For this reason, the canon ages are not okay, and we shouldn't act like they are. At the same time, however, we have to stop demonizing the people who enjoy the aspects of it that are good, because that, as well, is a valid interpretation of the writing. It is okay to like this ship. To pretend otherwise is to ignore the work and effort and skill that Tui put into writing it in its proper context. So, to conclude these thoughts, I would like to suggest to each of you that the next time you find yourself in a discussion about Glorybringer, whether you love it or hate it, consider the other perspective. I hope this video helped you think about something in a new light, and thank you for watching.